Today I'm going to teach you how to make an Anima Beyond Fantasy character. What is Anima Beyond Fantasy? Well, Anima Beyond Fantasy is a dead role-playing game from the mid-2000s. Why am I telling you how to make a character for it? Well, because it's an experience. A painful, horrifying experience. Making a character for Anima Beyond Fantasy is one of the most complicated things I have ever had to do in role-playing, and I would be remiss if I didn't share that pain with other people. Now, chances are you're here for one of three reasons. Either because you've heard about this system and you want to see what all the fuss is about, or you want to hear my take on it, which I'm flattered if you do. Or, most horrifyingly of all, you're actually attempting to make a character for this system, because your GM is a mad person who has gone completely insane and wants to run this system for you. Either way, I want you to grab a snack and something to drink and get yourself into a comfortable position because it's going to be a roller coaster. This is, this is insanity. To briefly summarize the concept of Anima, it's a high-flying wuja kung fu adventure set in the European Renaissance. It definitely has a very unique take on its world building and setting. I'm not going to talk too much about that because that would be its own video. But I happen to have played it semi-recently. And it wasn't super terrible once we got past this whole element. But it's definitely an interesting study in game design of its time period. And it's important to understand that at this point, 3rd uh, edition Dungeons & Dragons was reigning supreme as like the role-playing game. So it's interesting to see where other companies decided to take the concept of role-playing in light of what was popular at the time period. All right, so let's go ahead and tackle this abomination head on. There's only one thing you really need to know about the core mechanics of Anima in order to create the character, and that's that Anima is a true D100 system. It is not a percentile system. It is a D100, which means that whenever you take a test for any reason, what you do is you roll a D100, and then you take the number it rolled and add your skill value to attempt to beat a target number. Much in the same way you roll the d20 in Dungeons & Dragons, the d100 is your dice of choice in all instances here. Target numbers in this system can range anywhere from like 50 to 250. There is an enormous range, and if I could give one piece of advice, I would say do not attempt to be a jack-of-all-trades. Find out what you want to do and specialize in doing that thing because you are going to need all of the bonuses afforded to you to be able to do it. All right, we're just going to go ahead and start straight from the top of the character sheet here. All right, so we have all of the ancillary roleplay elements filled in right here. We're just going to fill in our character's name and all of the roleplay elements about our character that you're free to pick from and just customize at your leisure. They have n no standard in-game benefit. So you can feel free to just write whatever you feel like there. Anima is interesting because what it does is it has levels and build points. Why it felt like it needed to have both, I have no idea, but it does. Starting the game at level 1 affords you 600 build points, which you'll spend across the whole of this character creation process. I feel like it's imperative to warn you at this stage that there are also a series of other character building resources besides development points that you'll be using throughout the course of this process. It has like so many of them. <laughs> it, has, it has a lot. One of the first things you want to do is you want to pick your Raza, which is just the word that they use for your race. Anima is unique in that it doesn't have fantasy races as per se, like Dungeons and Dragons does. What it has is everybody is a human, but some humans have the souls of elves and dwarves and giants and orcs and other stuff like that. And these are called Nephilim, people who have these kinds of souls. If you have a soul that's of a creature that isn't human inside of you, you get various bonuses and abilities depending on the soul inside you. And you also incur an experience penalty that will tax the total experience you gain over the course of the game. If you don't feel like being an ensouled Nephilim, then you are just a normal human, which has no bonuses but incurs no experience penalty. Our DM was really cool when he ran this. We all chose to be Nephilim because we thought he being human would be really boring, so he just waived the experience penalty for the entire party, being as that we were all incurring an experience penalty. I didn't really feel like this made anyone too imbalanced. Personally, I kind of feel like the experience penalty is negligible. All right, we're just going to go ahead and pick human for our Raza. Not that being a human is very interesting, but it's going to make the process a little bit easier. <laughs> 
my overall intention is to have this character do a little bit of everything. Not that doing a little bit of everything is good. As I stated previously, it's actually very terrible. But I want to touch on all of the elements of character creation. We're going to end up making one of the worst characters you possibly could for Anima, but one of the most educational characters you possibly could make for Anima. So what you want to do now is determine your attributes. As you can see, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 attributes. Agility, Constitution, Dexterity, Strength, Intelligence, Perception, Power, and Willpower. The difference between agility and dexterity is that agility is total body movement and dexterity is fine motor skills. Constitution, strength, intelligence, perception, and willpower are all generally straightforward. They, they do exactly what they sound like they do. Power is charisma from Dungeons and Dragons. It is both your social stat and also your magic power. Or the force of your magic power, I should say. So now we go to the actual stat generation process. So when it comes to generating stats, there are four methods that the book provides you, but I think that the first one is the best, and it's the one that we chose to use when we played, so it's the one I'm going to be demonstrating here, which is where you roll 8 d10s, and then re-roll all 1s, 2s, and 3s, then replace your lowest number with 9, and then assign your attributes accordingly. So let's go ahead and make it happen. Oh wow, actually, that's... We rolled stupid high. <laughs> Dear God, where was this roll whenever I was playing this game the first time? Holy shit. So the result we have there is after rerolls and after uh, changing the lowest result to 9. So we're going to go ahead and just plug that right into the stat sheet here. So this is how I'm going to go ahead and choose to allocate my stats. Feel free to be completely jealous of this array. I know I would be. It's ludicrous. Can't help what the dice rolled. Maybe I fudge them, we'll never know. We don't have any bonuses or penalties to our Raza, so our base is equal to our actual. I'm not going to go ahead and write that here because that would be a gigantic waste of time. So now that we figured out what our stats are, we have to convert them into our bonuses, much like we have to do in Dungeons & Dragons. The number that you have corresponds to a bonus or penalty, depending on how high or low the number is. And just like in Dungeons & Dragons, it makes virtually no sense at all to convert them into these other numbers then the the process is very arcane but we'll go ahead and take a look at the chart right now all right so as you can see this is the chart which you use to convert your stats into the bonuses that you'll get on the dice rolls that you make using those stats okay and then we just go back into the character sheet and we plug in all of the bonuses to let us know how much we get whenever we roll that attribute Luckily for us, our array is pretty similar, so all of the bonuses are generally the same. Our lowest is intelligence at plus 5, the highest agility at plus 15, and everything else is plus 10. Generally speaking, the limit to stats is 10 at character creation, although your GM could waive that if they feel like it. The number that you see is the percent bonus to success. Because it's a D100 system, you're going to be adding those numbers to the D100. So while we did roll really high for our stats, 10% is just 10%. Our highest is 15%. Ooh, we're really rolling in the power, as you can see. For the most part, everything that you do, as you do in any d20 system or percentile system, is going to come down to just how good you roll. You will end up having enough bonuses in your skills to sort of sway whether or not you do pass something. The character that I was using was very stealthy, and with my gigantic bonus of like 105 or something like that to stealth, I generally passed every stealth check I was called upon to make. I was the stealthiest person. If you're not rocking anywhere from like 85 to 110 in your bonus, then you're not good at the thing you're attempting to do. <laughs> you can get away with like 75 or 65, but you want big, big numbers. And having big numbers on your stats is good, but your the numbers on your stats do not get very big, at least not at the beginning. So the next thing that you have are advantages and disadvantages, which are bonuses that your character gets, which you can kind of think of as feats. Uh, and disadvantages are negative feats if you've never played in a game that has disadvantages. The advantages are all very good and the disadvantages are all very brutal. You purchase advantages for your character with a resource called creation points, which is not the same thing as a development point, and you begin the game with three of those. Advantages will cost a variety of creation points. You earn additional creation points by taking disadvantages for your character up to a total of six creation points max for your character. So you could end up simply spending your three creation points and leaving it at that, or you could take disadvantages to get even more creation points. I don't recommend that you take disadvantages unless you really know what you're doing because they can be very brutal. 
As far as what advantages to pick, well, there's a wide list of them and you'll just have to read through that list when you go to make your character to figure out which ones you actually want. Personally, I'm just going to take add one to your characteristic three times. All right, skipping back over to the second character sheet, we just list plus one characteristic and then it's cost in the advantages section. I'm not going to go through the trouble of purchasing any disadvantages right now. It's simply too much of a commitment. You're just going to have to read through the whole list and decide for yourself which ones you want to pick. I highly recommend that you take both blind and deaf. That way uh, you can play Kung Fu Helen Keller. Okay, so I went ahead and just upgraded the three stats that I thought were the best to upgrade. I upgraded two nines to a ten to get that extra plus five to whatever it is they're rolling. And then I went ahead and upgraded my seven to an eight, so it went from five to ten. So now the next and possibly most important thing to do for your character is to pick your class. Your class details a lot of things, as you can see here, but the most important thing that it does is it details how much your skills and powers cost. Unlike in Dungeons & Dragons, classes in Anima can do anything. Some classes are better at doing certain things than others, and the way in which they represent that is how many development points those things cost when you take that class. So you're going to pick your class, and then it's going to list a series of costs next to all of the things you could possibly purchase as well as having a series of innate bonuses that you get per level simply for being the class. So you'll notice under primary attributes, secondary attributes, all of those things, there are plus something and then colon a number. The plus number is um, what you gain each time you purchase an increment, and the number after the colon is the cost and development points it takes to purchase that upgrade. Fighting classes are better at martial skills and shields and wearing armor and they have more health. Rogue classes are better at skills and sneaking around. Magic classes are better at magic. Psychic classes are better at psionics. There's really a wide variety of um, specialist and hybrid classes that you can pick from, and you'll probably find one that fits well for you. Alternatively, you can pick the freelancer, which is what we're going to go with, which is the one that is okay at everything. I don't recommend that you actually pick the freelancer. <laughs> You want to specialize in the thing that you're doing, and generally speaking, you want to be able to afford some skill at only one development point per upgrade, that way you can just stack it really high. If you really know what you're doing, or you have no clue what you're doing, then you can go ahead and pick the freelancer. So the first thing you'll notice is that each class has an archetype. This is merely a roleplay description of what the character class does. So martial classes will be like fighters and the rogue classes will be like scoundrels and stuff like that. It really doesn't actually mean anything. Next up is your life point multiplier, which is how many development points it takes to add your constitution bonus to your life point total. And your life points is how many life points you add to your total per level. So your total life points will be all of your life points per level, plus how many multipliers you've bought, which will be your constitution bonus times how many times you've bought that bonus. Hold on, it only gets more complicated. <laughs> The initiative entry represents the bonus per level that your class gets to their initiative value. That's pretty straightforward. Martial knowledge is a little bit more confusing. This is yet another resource separate from development points which you have. Your martial knowledge is how many martial knowledge points that your class gets per level, and these are used to purchase special martial abilities that we'll get to later on in the video. But generally they're spent on cultivating key techniques. Because in addition to having magic and psionic powers, you also have key. They wanted everything in this game. If D&D had it, this game had to have it too. And you had to be able to do all of it if you felt like it. Lastly, your innate psychic points are how many psi points you get per level. A character gets one psi point to start. Psi points are both a character building resource and a pool that you use to spend to use psychic powers. Yeah, that's only the first part of the class. Next up are your character's primary abilities, which are divided into their combat abilities, supernatural abilities, and psychic abilities. One would think that supernatural abilities are psychic abilities, but what the game means by supernatural is magic abilities. Why the developers really felt like they had to have both magic and psychic powers is a mystery lost to time. 
You'll notice at this stage that there is a percentage value listed next to each of these categories. This is the total amount of development points that you can spend out of your pool on each of those categories. So being that our total limit is 60% on each of those categories, we can spend up to 360 development points on skills in each of those categories out of our total pool of 600 development points. So just to start off, your attack value, for example, is you like your base attack bonus. It's what you add to all physical attacks. Bear in mind that this system is a D100 like true system. So when it says plus one to attack, that is a 1% increase in your chance to make the attack actually connect. The amount of bonus that you buy with your development points for these skills is a direct increase in the percent chance that you have to succeed by the amount you purchase. The math could not be more straightforward on these. However, the math could also not be more stark. Your block and dodge bonuses are rolled whenever you are attacked, depending on how you choose to defend yourself against the attack. When you are attacked, you choose to either to attempt to dodge the attack or attempt to block the attack. Dodging is generally a little more difficult, but successfully dodging the attack means you suffer no damage. Blocking is a little more reliable, but you will take some damage that will be negated by your shield and other stuff like that. Your wear armor stat is literally your training in wearing armor. Yes, real life armor actually takes training to wear and to perform tasks while wearing. It takes a lot of practice to be able to do things inside armor. Normally most role playing games uh, are content to waive armor training uh, or relegate it to a binary state. Either you are trained in wearing the armor or you aren't, but Anima has a skill for it and each point that you put into your wear armor stat cancels the exceptionally egregious penalty that armor imposes on you on a one for one basis. Sometimes you might roll your wear armor stat. I'm not entirely certain if you do. I don't remember exactly, but you do want to stack up that skill if you plan on wearing heavy armor and being able to do anything else. So next up we have the key stat. Key is the resource that you use to use key abilities, and the stat represents how many DP it takes to increase your key pool by one point. Pretty simple. What's not so simple is key accumulation, which is the rate at which you gain key per round. <laughs> so the number on the right of the colon on that is how many development points it takes to raise your key accumulation by one. And that rate is how much key you can build up in a single round. It'll make a little bit more sense when we talk about key abilities later in the video, but you it's oh oh my god <laughs> you have so many stats in this game it's so brutal we're not even done yet that was just combat abilities we've still got the rest of it to do <laughs> i'm just gonna go ahead and take the time to say that there is a reason i did not play a magical character <laughs> when i first played this because i refused <laughs> to learn how any of this stuff worked beyond the bare minimum it took for me to play the character. I did have to have martial abilities. Whether you have any magic or psychic powers, you will build up enough key and uh, martial abilities to have those abilities. It'll be real slow going if you didn't specialize in them, but you will get them eventually. They are helpful, but... If you don't spec into them, you don't have to worry about them right at the beginning. <laughs> Zeon is the game's fancy word for mana. For an amount of points listed to the right of the colon, you increase your Zeon pool by 5. Your Zeon pool represents the total amount of Zeon you have at your disposal. Magic Accumulation is the stat which represents how much of that Zeon you can choose to invest in casting a spell in a single turn. For example, if you have a magical accumulation of 30, you can cast any spell with a Zeon cost of 30 or less in a single turn. If it has a beyond 30 but up to 60, it'll take two turns to cast. Beyond 60 but up to 90, three turns to cast, so on. So you have a base amount of magic accumulation equal to your power, and much like health, every time you purchase a multiple of magic accumulation, it adds that bonus to your total magic accumulation for each multiple you've purchased. 
Briefly flitting back over to the character sheet, you'll notice that our power bonus is 15, so our base magic accumulation is 15, and every time we purchase a multiple, it'll go up by an additional 15 for every multiple we've purchased. Though it gets worse. <laughs> Magical Projection is your spellcasting ability. It's what you roll when you are casting a spell. It's also what you roll whenever you're defending against a spell. If you plan on casting any spells at all, it's a good idea to heavily invest in it. Magic Projection does have a special rule attached to it where you can only spend half of the total limit of development points on Magic Projection. So for example, because our limit is 60% of our total development points on Supernatural Abilities, which would translate for us into 360 development points. We can only spend half that many development points on Magical Projection. The next four skills underneath that directly tie into summoning creatures. Summoning is a direct link to how powerful the creature is that you can summon. Control is like how many Pokemon badges you have, and if you don't have enough of those Pokemon badges, you can't issue the creature you summon any orders. Binding is the skill you use to tie the creature to the material plane so that you can keep it trapped here and continue to boss it around. And banishing is the skill you use to get rid of it when you're bored and you want a new toy or to banish other people's summon spirits. Psychic abilities. <laughs> Psychic points are like Xeon and are used to cast innate psychic powers, and are also used to invest in constantly going static psychic powers that are just kind of like, like an aura or like fixed effect that's constantly in play. Psychic projection is the same thing as magic projection, but for psychic powers. Okay, so for the sake of just showing you how it works, I'm distributing my build points evenly among all aspects of the character, so I'm spending 120 points on combat skills, 120 points on magic skills, and 120 points on psychic powers. None of those investments will really pay off for the character. Like I said, we're not building an effective character, I'm just attempting to show you how it works. The Freelancer, which is the class that we've chosen, buys every bonus at two development points, which is the average. If a class is really skilled, they'll buy their bonus at one development point per bonus, and if they really suck at it, they'll buy it at three development points per bonus. So because the Freelancer is aggressively average at everything, um, we get half the total points we invest in the particular aspect as a bonus. So, as you can see, our attack block and dodge all have a 20 base bonus, which we've purchased with 40 development points apiece for a total of 120. Then you add your respective attribute bonuses and then any free bonuses you might get from your class to form the total bonus that you will add to your d100 when you roll to either make an attack or defend against an attack depending on which one of those you pick all right round two of recording this thing <laughs> all right so the next thing we have to do is calculate our secondary abilities which are like our skills under the secondary abilities category it lists seven categories of uh skills that you'll put points into there are uh, many, many more skills under each of those categories. The price on the right of the colon is the DP that you use to upgrade any of the skills in that category by one point. So the, the class lists skill prices in clusters based on category. The reduced cost section is a special case for a lot of classes where sometimes what they will do is they can purchase a particular skill for cheaper than the category price. So for example, some classes might purchase athletics at uh, 2 DP for 1 bonus, but they'll purchase jumping specifically 1 for 1. The freelancer doesn't do any of that, but a lot of other classes do have special uh, reduced prices for certain skills. Finally, we have innate bonuses, which is a class's special bonuses that it gets generally per level to any number of things listed previously in their entry. So the freelancer gets a free 10 Xeon a level. Some classes get skill bonuses, some classes get like attack bonus. It really just depends on what the class is and what they're trying to do. The freelancer also gets uh, plus 10 to any five skills per level, so they get a free 50 points to distribute across the board in increments of 10 to any of their secondary abilities, which is pretty good, honestly. 
Since the freelancer purchases all of its skills at a two for one basis, you're saving yourself a hundred points a level. And finally, they have any other special bonuses that they get. In the case of the freelancer, they multi-class better than other classes. Multi-classing is its own other separate can of worms. I don't recommend that you open that right now. Uh, we're not going to talk about that right now, probably in another video. I wouldn't recommend that you do any multi-classing unless you really, really know what you're doing. All right, so we're going to go ahead and simply put 80 points into skills. As you can see, I didn't bother to fill out the rest of the skills. You can see how many other skills there are here in in the skills category. I didn't bother to write any of that out. I merely spent 80 points across athletics in two lumps of 40 just to show you how it goes. So up in the circle, you put how many points it takes to upgrade any of the skills in that category. The bracket is for uh, any reduced cost the class might give you to that particular skill. Your base is how many points you buy for that skill. The bonus is your attribute bonus, which in the case of each of these is 15, except for the one that's strength. Special is any special bonus you get. And your class bonus is any bonus that the class gives you to that particular skill. And then your final is the total bonus that you get when rolling that on the D100. As you can see, they're very bad. <laughs> Even the ones that are in the 60s are not fantastic. They're clearly the best ones that I bothered to invest any points into. But this is what a standard array of, of skills in one category looks like with an investment of 80 build points. You got to pump those numbers in if you want to get those numbers up. It's the exchange rate is ridiculous. You really want to be purchasing everything in this game at a one for one basis, because even two for one is something of a big ask. And three for one is never put any DP into that. Never put any points into something that you have to buy at a three for one basis. OK, for the rest of this video, I'm going to just go ahead and fill in the ancillary stuff without going into martial knowledges, magic, psychic projection or equipment, because those are so in depth, they're going to require their own video or possibly multiple other videos. <laughs> and I don't want to make this like an hour and a half. For right now, this is just purely the basics. So we're just going to go ahead and fill in the rest of the um, peripheries of the character, starting with life points. All right, so life points are calculated in a very wonky way. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to take the number 20, which is the base life points for all living things. Then you're going to add your constitution score, not your bonus, multiplied by 10. Then you're going to add or subtract the bonus from your constitution score. <laughs> Why it felt it needed to be so complicated, I have no idea, but there it is. A player can also spend an amount of DP to purchase a life point multiplier. The life point multiplier increases their total life points by their constitution score, not the bonus, every time they purchase a modifier. So if you buy three modifiers, it will add your constitution score three times to your base number that you calculated with the previous equation. Okay, so right up here under life points, we have the number multiple, which is essentially just your constitution score, which is the number that your life points will go up every time you purchase a multiplier. Your base value, which for us at a constitution of 9, is 120. How many your class gives you as a base level up bonus, and how many multiples you've purchased. We're going to go ahead and buy one multiple because we want our character to be doo-doo. And then we go ahead and reach our total, which is 134. What a song and dance just to get that number. All right, the next thing to calculate right next door to health is initiative. Initiative is calculated pretty easily. You start with a base of 20. Then you add the bonuses to agility and dexterity, plus your class bonuses per level. Then you subtract the negative modifiers from whatever armor and weapon you're wearing, and this gives you your final initiative score. They provide you with a series of different categories, SP1 through SP4 like or whatever, for you to go ahead and calculate different initiative bonuses based on loadouts that you have that you prefer. So if your character is wearing their heavy armor using their heavy weapon, they might have a one kind of initiative bonus. And if they're in their pajamas with a dagger, they're going to have a different kind of bonus. You're given a few categories to really like map out the total series of initiatives your character could have across all instances. And that'll save time in the long run if you care to do it to do it that way. 
if your character only ever has one loadout and sleeps in their armor, then <laughs> they're only ever going to have one initiative value, so you can safely ignore the rest of that if it's not something you want to calculate. Right now, the character doesn't have any weapons or armor because we haven't purchased them yet, uh, and we're going to go ahead and do that in another video because there's quite a lot to weapons and armor. <laughs> So the next thing to calculate at the top right of the screen there is presence. A character's presence is the sum of all of their physical and spiritual presence, their energy. This is like a, a passive stat that levels up as you level up. You don't really do anything to sort of like enhance it in any way other than simply be stronger yourself. It is your total development points that you've accumulated across your whole character's lifespan divided by 20. So for a first level character at 600 development points, you'll have a 30 in presence. It's that easy. It's just a passive thing to keep track of as you level up. You don't really do anything to affect it. It just kind of goes up itself. All right, the next thing to calculate right under presence is your resistances, which are physical disease, poison, magic, and psychic resistance. Physical resistance is your ability to resist falling unconscious from damage shock, and then disease through psychic is simply your resistance to those things and your ability to recover from being affected by them. So resistances are calculated simply by adding your presence and the bonus you get from the corresponding attribute together to form your total. So as you level up, all of your resistances will level up with you, and as your attributes improve, the corresponding resistance will also improve. Okay, in no particular order, we're just going to start filling in the rest of it. The wear armor stat, the class buys it at two build points for one base, so I went ahead and put the base at 30 for 60 development points. All right, going to movement. Your base movement is your agility characteristic, not your bonus, your characteristic. Plus or minus any modifiers for terrain or armor, etc., things like that. And then that will form your total movement value. Your distance per combat turn is calculated on a chart. So for our 10, at this stage wearing no armor in our pajamas with a knife, uh, we move 115 feet a turn with a move action. So we're pretty fast. Unless we were doing something that slowed us down. All right, right next to movement is fatigue. Fatigue are kind of like action points that you can spend to make rolls better. You also lose one fatigue for every 30 minutes of hard work or two hours of light work you perform in game. And as your fatigue drops to a certain number or lower, you start accumulating massive penalties to your ability to do stuff and it will eventually push you to have to take rests. The varying effects of fatigue can be found in the charts in the book but your base fatigue is equal to your constitution score, not its modifier. So you'll want to manage your fatigue points based on what you need in the moment and how much longer you have to go before you need to take a rest. With a high constitution score, you have a wide pool of points to play around with. With a very low constitution score, you're going to just want to hold them in reserve to keep you going. The penalties start accumulating at four fatigue and lower, so if you do only have four constitution, <laughs> you're going to start feeling the effects pretty handedly, like straight off the bat. Anyway, that's going to be it for right now. Uh, I hope this gave you at least a little bit of appreciation into how much of a nightmare process this is, and is still going to be, and I hope you join me for video number two where I start getting into the key powers and spells and all that stuff because it, it's not going to get any, any easier than it already has. This is such a tiring system to make characters in. And it's so needlessly complicated. And then it tells you you need certain things, like bonuses to your attributes, and those calculate everything. Then, like, I think well over half of the things that you calculate don't use the bonus. They use the actual value of the stat. Again, though, like, playing the game wasn't that bad, because everything's written down, and whenever you're called on to take a test, you just add your number to the dice roll and then tell the DM what you rolled and then they tell you whether you passed or failed much like you do in D&D &D or any other RPG. It's all of this front loading of the effort onto the player with character creation that I feel like turned a lot of people off to the system. And when you, when you look at what you actually end up doing versus what you had to do to get to that point, it feels very needless. It does not feel like you needed to go through all of this effort just to get a bonus that you're going to add to a dice roll. Which is why, as D&D's lifespan has progressed, it's only gotten less complicated. Like, the steps you need to take to get to the part 
where you add up all your numbers together and add them to the d20 roll have only been becoming less and less as time has gone on if you look back to like ad and d and stuff like that there were charts and a lot of calculations and then third edition had a lot of different bonuses you added together uh, and then fourth edition sort of streamlined the process it was like half level plus stat plus like other bonuses and then now it's proficiency plus attribute plus uh you know just miscellaneous bonuses so Role-playing games have sort of come to the realization that you don't need to force your players to go through all these elaborate steps just to have them generate a number when you could just hand them a number. We're never going to end up really seeing systems like this again, I don't think. There would have to be a massive shift in societal consciousness where people value the performing of huge formulas and processes and a little bunch of steps and stuff like that as a means of pride or something to that effect for these kinds of games to get more complicated. Generally speaking, people like simplicity, and that's why we've seen in the last, you know, eight years, ten years, whatever, RPGs taking steps to become simpler and easier to get into so that anybody can just pick up and play them and you don't have to go through a lot of effort like those but we are going to go through more effort in the next video where i cover all of the other stuff i'll see you guys on the next one keep playing obscure exceptionally complicated role-playing games everybody